considered in the House today. The elimination of the Election Assistance Commission set up after the 2000 Bush Gore campaign to ensure that state election officials have updated voting machines and training. Senate coming in at 2.15, Eastern back from their party caucuses at 2.15. And you can follow the Senate on C-SPAN 2, now live to the U.S. House. House will be in order. Chair lays before the House communication from the Speaker. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., June 21, 2011. I hereby appoint the Honorable Michael K. Simpson to act as Speaker pro tempore on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Pursuant to the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the Chair will now recognize members from lists submitted by the majority and minority leaders for morning hour debate. The Chair will alternate recognition between the parties, with each party limited to one hour and each member other than the majority and minority leaders and the minority whip limited to five minutes each. But in no event shall debate continue beyond 1.50 p.m. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, while it's imperative that we reduce the federal deficit, balancing the budget on the backs of our nation's disadvantaged children and senior citizens is neither responsible nor equitable. I believe in an America that protects the young and the elderly. But the Republican budget attacks the important safeguards for children and the disadvantaged replacing Medicaid with vastly limited monetary grants to the states, forcing them to either reduce benefits to lower income families or reduce the number of eligible families. Currently, 34 million children receive health care through Medicaid. From 1997 to 2009, the percentage of children without health insurance, as a result, dropped from 13.9% to 8.2%. The Republican budget's attacks on Medicaid will imperil the health insurance for 21,100 children and reduce the benefits for 6,100 seniors in my district, the 11th District of Virginia. Unfortunately, the Republican attacks on our seniors don't end with Medicaid. Imagine a world where half of all seniors lack health insurance. Imagine a world in which the rising cost of health care threaten retirees' ability to afford essential medicine their doctor prescribed. Imagine a world where more than one out of every three seniors lives in poverty, and the choice for the day is between food and their drugs. This isn't a dystopian nightmare. It was the United States in 1965, before we passed Medicare. Seniors suffering from arthritis, hypertension, coronary disease, cancer, glaucoma, and any number of ailments lacked coverage and far too often fell to financial distress. But thanks to Medicare, we changed all of that, providing guaranteed health insurance coverage to our nation's seniors. As a result, the senior poverty rate decreased by 75 percent. But our retirees once again face that nightmare scenario as the Republican budget plan for fiscal 2012 seeks to eliminate Medicare for everyone 54 years and younger and forces future retirees into funding uh, insurance in the private market. The private market which could choose not to offer them coverage at all. Many seniors will be forced to pay more for health insurance. Many seniors won't find any coverage. Under the Republican plan for Medicare, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, retirees in 2022 will pay $6,400 more per year than they otherwise would under the traditional Medicare coverage. In addition, the Republican budget reopens Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage gap or the donut hole, which will cost seniors thousands of dollars each year for prescription medication. Prescription drugs can be expensive, and many of the medications seniors take are long-term. People take medication daily to control their arthritis pain or lower their cholesterol and reduce the risk of stroke. These life-saving medications come at a price. The implementation of Medicare Part D in 2005 left many seniors with a gap in coverage, the donut hole. This gap, the initial coverage limit, and the catastrophic coverage amount cost many seniors thousands of dollars a year. I was proud to vote to eliminate that donut hole in 2009 with the health care reform bill. Unfortunately, just two years later, the Republican attack on Medicare reinstates the donut hole, once again threatening seniors with thousands of dollars in medication costs. Mr. Speaker, I know our constituents want the Congress to get our fiscal house in order, and they're right. But Americans don't want us to eviscerate Medicare and attack retiree health insurance as part of that process. I recently held a telephone town hall meeting 
and I conducted a poll. 1,700 people participated in that poll. 73% said, do not gut Medicare. True fiscal responsibility requires a firm commitment and shared sacrifice. It involves long-term focus to rein in and reduce spending in a responsible, sustained manner. Real fiscal discipline requires us to look at every area of the budget, including revenues, savings, efficiencies, and cuts where necessary. Ultimately, the budget represents our nation's priorities. Reducing deficits is a significant priority, and as my constituents in the 11th District of Virginia have made clear, protecting seniors and their Medicare is equally significant. I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Request permission to revise and extend my report. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, it's turn out the lights. The party is almost over for the incandescent light bulb. Four years ago, a law went into place which mandated that every light bulb across America must be 25 percent more efficient by 2014. What this meant was that the incandescent light bulbs, Thomas Edison's greatest invention, is being banned and Americans will be forced to buy the government-selected replacement, the compact fluorescent light bulb. There are health risk problems with the compact fluorescent light bulb, or the CFL as it's called. The National Institute of Health states that fluorescent bulbs contain mercury. Now, isn't that lovely? Further, another federal agent, agency, the EPA, warns that the broken bulb contains mercury and con will continue to release mercury vapor until it is cleaned up and removed from the room. End of quote. Mr. Speaker, I thought we were trying to get rid of mercury in our products in this country. So, in ca case we happen to break one of these new glass fragile light bulbs, and I have one here, and I'm going to be very careful not to drop it on the House floor, because if I do, we'll have to evacuate the House floor, because here's what the EPA says and advises we're to do to clean up the poisonous debris in this light bulb. And I'm reading from the EPA's verbatim website. Have people and pets leave the room. Air out the room for five to ten minutes by opening a window or a door to the outdoors. Now, how do you do that in a high-rise, Mr. Speaker? You shut off the central heating and air conditioning system. Collect materials needed to clean up the broken bulb. I guess we have to use glove and duct tapes. And place the cleanup materials in a sealable container. Promptly place all bulb debris and cleanup materials outdoors in a trash container or protected area until materials can be disposed of properly. Avoid leaving any bulb fragments or cleanup materials inside the room. It goes on. Continue to air out the room where the bulb was broken and leave the heating and air conditioning system shut off for several hours. I might note this is just the condensed instructions. The EPA has provided more detailed instructions on its website, and I ask unanimous consent to submit this three-page single-space typed over a thousand words on how to clean up one of these light bulbs if it's broken into the record, Mr. Speaker. Without objection. Recently, the French have noted that CF bu CFL bulbs can harm a child's vision because they contain arsenic, among other poisons. And the German scientists have found that these CFL bulbs can also cause cancer. Now, isn't that an odd uh, idea, that these bulbs mandated by the federal government actually are harmful to our health? We should forget school lunches, Mr. Speaker. We now need to worry about our children's eyesight because of the lighting they sit under every day in a classroom, all thanks to the blind federal government. The federal government's anti-energy, anti-consumer choice regulation leaves Americans no other option but to purchase and use a harmful, poisonous product. If that's not reason enough to get rid of these bulbs, here's another one. None of these bulbs are made in the USA. You look very carefully on every one of these bulbs, they will say, made in China. That's right. Our good buddies, the Chinese, make all of these bulbs. The last major factory in the United States that, was, that made incandescent light bulbs closed down September 14, 2010. This ended a manufacturing industry that began all the way back to Thomas Edison. So these job-producing light bulb factories have been shipped off to China and now to Mexico, leaving even more Americans out of work. In fact, the light bulb that I just read to you or read off of says it is made in China. And it's in several languages, of course. So the federal government imposed a burdensome, harmful to your health regulation. An American factory closed. Jobs moved overseas. We sort of heard this story before. 
But there's a bright spot to this sad tale. Just yesterday, the state of Texas passed a law that protects Texans from this absurd abuse of federal power. The law will allow Texans to continue to buy incandescent bulbs that are made in the state of Texas, keeping the government out of people's lives and keeping jobs in America, even if it is in Texas. And let's not forget that this regulation is unconstitutional. The federal government does not have the authority to force anybody to buy anything, from health care insurance to a box of donuts or even a light bulb, especially if the light bulb is hazardous to America's health. Nowhere in the Constitution does the federal government have such ab abusive power. So it's time we repeal the unconstitutional, job-killing, bad-for-your-health light bulb mandate. Other otherwise, it looks like we'll be singing the party's over for the incandescent light bulb. Because they say all good things must end. Call it a night, the party's over, and tomorrow starts the same old thing again. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, for five minutes. seen some pretty miserable employment numbers uh, recently, but the real unemployment rate is actually about twice what you read in the paper. It's closer to 18 percent with discouraged workers and people uh, who are underemployed. Now, are, can we look to Washington for solutions? On the Republican side of the aisle, the answer is simple. More tax cuts! That'll put people back to work. Let's see. For 10 years now, I've been living under the Bush tax cuts. Um, we've had the worst job creation for the last decade since World War II. Now, it doesn't seem to be working too well, but it's all based on the theory of trickle-down. But I think at this point, the American people have been trickled on so much, particularly those who are unemployed and looking for work, that they'd like an umbrella. And they'd like a little shelter from these nonsensical policies. Well, can we look to the White House? Well, unfortunately, things aren't a lot better uh, down at the White House. Uh, they went along uh, with uh, the Republicans on quite a bit of these tax cuts. Forty percent of the so-called stimulus was tax cuts. Seven percent. One-sixth of that was invested in infrastructure. And guess what? That investment at one-sixth the cost of the tax cuts put a heck of a lot more people to work. Investment in building things and in the future of our country as opposed to debt-driven, consumption-driven tax cuts. Now, last December, the president caved and went along with extending the Bush tax cuts. And we've still got miserable job creation. Oh, wow, that's a surprise. Now, they've floated a balloon. White House has a great new idea. Let's continue the Social Security tax holiday. That was a part of the Bush, uh, added to the Bush tax cuts in December. That's created a lot of jobs. Sure, working families can use an extra 15 bucks a week. But what about the 20 million people who are unemployed? They don't get any of that. And how much of that $15 a week, how many jobs does that create? But the White House thinks we should extend that, and maybe we should give it on the employer side, too. So here's the way it'll work. We don't have the money. We're going to cut the Social Security tax. Again, we have to make the trust fund hold, so we'll borrow $200 billion from China that we'll put into the Social Security trust fund, and that's going to put America back to work. What a great idea. Wait a minute. How about we take that $200 billion the White House wants to borrow to extend the Social Security tax holiday and we invest it in real things, the nation's crumbling infrastructure. We have 20% unemployment in the construction industry, and it isn't just construction workers who go to work when we rebuild our infrastructure. We have Buy America requirements. They're all American jobs, and everything that goes into every job is made in America. If it's a transit system, you've got engineers, you've got software, you've got high-tech manufacturing. If it's a bridge, you've got steel, you've got concrete, you've got engineering design, you've got construction workers. If it's a highway, the same thing. Take that money. Take that $200 billion they want to borrow and give a Social Security tax holiday. Instead, invest it in the future of this country in things that will serve our country for 100 years, make us more productive, more efficient, and you can look your grandkids in the eye 15, 20, 30 years from today and say, yeah, that's right, we borrowed that money and you're still paying the bill. If you give it for a Social Security tax holiday, you're going to say, Granddad, why'd you spend that $17 on that week? Because I'm paying the bill. But how about Granddad can say, we built that bridge, we built that transit system, 
We rebuilt our national transportation system. We put millions to work, and guess what? That system will serve you for another 100 years. That's an investment versus consumption. Everybody around here is just into consumption. We need to invest in the future of our country. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, for five minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past weekend, I had the opportunity in Hobbs, New Mexico, to attend two services, two uh, recognition ceremonies for people from Hobbs. First of all, we were able to attend the retirement for Dr. Dean Mathis, who pastored Taylor Memorial Baptist Church for 36 years. Same preacher, same church, uh, just not heard of these days in America. Health teachers are required to do two very difficult things. They're required to push our our knowledge base to the extreme limits of what we are able to, to know. But uh, simultaneously with that, they have to stay grounded in truth. In other words, you can't just teach out to the edge of the learning envelope. You also have to stay grounded in the timeless principles that cause things to be relevant and true. Dr. Mathis did this with extreme care and with a delicacy that I found always attractive. He was able to bring biblical lessons to life and our personal lives to, to give us relevance to those teachings. Uh, I think that also he uh, perfected the, uh, the community participation in all levels. From his one small congregation there in Hobbs, New Mexico, we had city councilors, county commissioners, judges, two state representatives, a state senator and a U.S. congressman. Now that says a lot coming from one small corner of, of the, uh, the state of New Mexico. But his uh, life didn't end there. He also had two missionaries check in from very difficult parts of the world. They were on Skype and checked in uh, at the ceremonies saying that if it hadn't been for his teachings that they would not have been there. Dr. Mathis and his wife Betty Sue dedicated their lives to the spiritual callings and without those spiritual teachings in our society today, we find our society is drifting towards moral chaos. We're dealing with those problems here in this Congress as we deal with uh, teen pregnancies, with hunger, with people who are wasting their lives on drugs and taking extraordinary amounts of Medicaid. So we deal with the problems of a society that is becoming all too secular and forgetting that no matter what we pass as laws here, that there is a moral component to every nation and that if we ignore that, we ignore it at our peril. I would like to give my congratulations to Dr. Dean Mathis and his wife Betty Sue for their years of service. But then on the same day, we were able to recognize Carl Mackey. Carl Mackey was a few years younger than me, passed away at too early an age last year. Carl Mackey was a community leader. He was one of the friends, one of the uh, many people that my mom had in class. She used to talk about Carl and said, uh, Carl's really mobile. That meant Carl was walking up and down all the time during classes. Carl was actually one of her favorite students. Now, I know mom and Carl both personally, and uh, they, they probably did not agree on one philosophical issue. Carl was a hardcore Democrat, community activist, black leader. Mom just uh, was conservative, raised a conservative family. But they identified each other across that um, chasm of, of philosophy to recognize that there aren't many differences in us when we accept the human nature that says that everyone should have access to justice, to mercy, to kindness. And so it was in that that uh, this young junior high student and mom formed a relationship that continued until uh, he passed away was able to visit with mom about their relationship this last weekend and she still remembers it with a smile. When I was elected and Carl Mackey was serving, Carl and I again overcame all the supposed difficulties, the things that we did not see eye to eye on in our philosophies, but we did see eye, eye, eye to eye in having him represent a piece of the community that is often forgotten. That was the community that I grew in, the southern part of Hobbs, the part of Hobbs that did not get its fair share of funding, fair share of justice. So Carl was a constant voice reminding all of us that uh, we need to stop, slow down just a bit, and pay attention to the small guys in society. He'll be greatly missed. Dr. Mathis and his wife will be greatly missed. But I think the community of Hobbs taking the time to honor two different people, completely different backgrounds, completely different lives, who weren't so different after all, 
In the end, we're all Americans, and we're here for a better America. I salute them both. Yield back the balance of my time. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor a great American, Mr. James Armstrong of Birmingham, Alabama, and the inspiring documentary of his life entitled The Barber of Birmingham, Foot Soldier for Civil Rights. This film had its world premiere in January at the Sundance Film Festival and later won Best Documentary Short uh, at the Ashland Independent Film Festival. In March, the city of Birmingham hosted a red carpet screening of this wonderful movie, um, and it was attended by over 2,000 Alabamians. It was featured at the Alabama Theater, a venue that once refused admission to African Americans. Tonight, we will celebrate the Barber of Birmingham with its Washington, D.C. premiere. Later this week, the documentary will be screened at Civil Docs, Festival in Silver Spring, Maryland. Mr. Speaker, the screening of this film and its historic accounts are deserving of tribute. I commend the independent filmmakers and co-directors Robin Friday and the late Gail Dolgen for their collaborative vision in capturing the essence of Mr. James Armstrong's life. A Birmingham legend and civil rights activist, this documentary celebrates the thousands of foot soldiers whose names are not written in the history book, but on whose shoulders we all stand. I applaud the directors for their wonderful rendition of Mr. James's, Mr. James Armstrong's life. I applaud Gail Dolgen for her steadfast determination to battle breast cancer while co-directing and editing the film from her hospice bed in order to submit the film for the Sundance Film Festival. She died two weeks prior. I pay homage to Miss Amelia Boynton of Selma, who was interviewed and provided historical accounts for segments of the film. The film also visited and revisited the news footage of the beating of Miss Amelia Boynton and others endured and others that endured beatings on Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday during their march for Voting Rights Act. Though she is ill, Mrs. Boynton was determined to travel the distance to be a part of tonight's premiere. I am inspired by the courage and determination displayed by Mrs. Boynton, who at 99 years old would not be deterred and will be here tonight at the premiere of the Barber of Birmingham right here at the Capitol Visitor Center. James Armstrong, who died at 81 in November 2009, lived to see the fulfillment of his dream when our nation elected its first African-American president. I recognize him for a symbol of everything that is good and right and great in this nation. For over 50 years, Mr. Armstrong opened a barbershop in Birmingham, Alabama. It served as a community hub for discussions of current events like Voting Rights Act, education, and other civil rights issues. Mr. James Armstrong was a World War II Army veteran, and he made his mark on the civil rights movement as a foot soldier who carried the American flag at the head of the 1965 Selma to Montgomery March, Bloody Sunday as it's known. When authorities turned on the marchers that day. Mr. Armstrong dropped to his knees, but he never let go of that flag. Proudly, James Armstrong carried that flag until the day he died on 2009 for every commemoration of Bloody Sunday March. As many in this august body will note, our colleague, the Honorable John Lewis of Georgia, was among the foot soldiers of this historic march. I salute Mr. Armstrong and his sons, Dwight and Floyd, for fulfilling the destiny meant for them. You know, he and his sons filed a discrimination lawsuit that, that uh, encouraged blacks to actually attend elementary schools in the Deep South, breaking barriers in public education in Birmingham and throughout the South. They filed a, a de desegregation lawsuit in 1963. The Armstrongs lived close to where civil rights activists, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth's home was bombed, and where the four little black girls were killed in the 16th Avenue Baptist Church just five days after they integrated Graymont Elementary School. 
Dwight and Floyd needed a federal escort to school for two years and were guarded at the night by shotguns by members of the, Amer by, uh, members of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Now, these selfless acts by James Floyd and Dwight Armstrong added significantly to the quality of life of all citizens in Alabama and in Birmingham. That is why I stand before you today to recognize Mr. James Armstrong, a proud American, a proud Alabamian, for his unrelenting dedication to the civil rights movement. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take a point of personal privilege by saying to all of you assembled that I grew up in Selma, Alabama, and I take great pride May I have one more minute? I take great pride the in chair, paying tribute to the a chair cannot entertain requests for Tonight we will see the premiere of the Barber of Birmingham, and I encourage all to see it when it comes to a theater near you. Members are reminded to address the remarks to the chair. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As always, it's an honor to speak here, House of Representatives. I uh, heard Democratic friend mention earlier that what we need to do to get the economy going is start spending on infrastructure, but because our grandchildren will really appreciate the dollars that they have to pay years from now that we spent on infrastructure. The only thing is, that's exactly what our friends across the aisle were saying in January of 2009 when they wanted an $800 billion stimulus package that turned out to be maybe $900 or a trillion. It was going to be for infrastructure, and, and many in the American public said, yeah, that's a good idea. turned out that uh, only around 6% or so, 6 to 7% may have been for infrastructure. Okay, fool us once. Shame on you, fool us twice, shame on us. Thing is, some of us weren't fooled even back then. We'd already uh, seen things that were said that would be done that were not done. So I voted against that so-called porculous stimulus, whatever you want to call it, bill. I would voted against TARP because... Uh, in America, we're not supposed to just give one man $700 billion and say, go, do whatever you want with all this money. Uh, we don't care. Just fix things, because he certainly didn't fix things, although he did engorge his buddies at Goldman Sachs. Um, nonetheless, uh, we do face economic difficulties. And uh, within the last two weeks, uh, there were six of us, bipartisan group in Turkey, um, their economy seems to be going very well, and we were seeing things growing and doing well in Istanbul, and, and they don't understand sarcasm very well. And so, but I nonetheless said to some of their economic leaders, uh, business leaders, um, so you must have had many huge stimulus packages to get the economy going. They looked at me like I was crazy because they don't understand sarcasm very well in another language, I guess, but they spoke good English. Nonetheless, they didn't use stimulus packages, but they did say they had dropped their uh, corporate tax rate that was much too high down to 20 percent, and now businesses have been coming in. Gee, that works. It works whenever it's been tried. But let me get to another point. Credibility is always relevant. And my days as a judge and chief justice, that was one of the rules of court. Credibility is always an issue. It's always relevant. So when this country makes promises to people and doesn't keep them, or they're stupid promises to people we know will not keep their word to us, we lose credibility. We found out now that this administration is negotiating with the Taliban. Basically, you know, just let us out. We're negotiating with the Taliban? Did Hoover negotiate with Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde? You know, did Robert Kennedy as Attorney General negotiate with the mob? When people are involved and they're criminals, and they're murderers, and they're engaged in criminal activity, and they've never kept a promise. 
Do you really want to be making that deal? Now, I know it seemed like we should have learned a lesson from the Clinton administration when North Korea was trying to build nukes. The Clinton administration sends Madeleine Albright, and she comes in, hey, 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 how about dropping pursuing nuclear weapons? We'll build you a nuclear power plant if you'll just, you'll build us nuclear power plant if we just tell you we won't pursue them. Sure, we'll tell you that all day long. So they cut a deal. We built a nuclear plant, and that has been used to develop nuclear weapons, just like anybody should have figured it would. When you deal with criminals, with lying thugs, you can't trust that agreement. For us to be negotiating with the Taliban is a, a blight on those who've given their lives there. And I attended a funeral this weekend of Brad Gaudet, who went down in a helicopter accident June the 5th. We owe those people who have given their lives fighting against those who want to destroy our way of life better than cutting a deal. Let's rearm the Northern Alliance, the people that originally defeated the Taliban. Let's give them the advisors, the trainers, all that they need, and let them whip the Taliban for us again. Let's don't negotiate with Dillinger. It makes no sense, and we lose credibility. I yield back. Chair lays before the House following the roll bills. Senate Joint Resolution 9, providing for the reappointment of Robert P. Kogod as a citizen regent of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until 2 p.m. today. And the House returns at 2 Eastern for one-minute speeches. Legislative work starts at 5.30 Eastern. Members will consider five bills, four dealing with naming of post 